Um, I'm Cindy Seeley. I'm Vice President of Kansas City Investment Group. And so I'm up here tonight. Dave wasn't able to make it this evening. So um, first off, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules and coming tonight. Thank you very much. And is everyone ready to learn something tonight? Sure. Are you sure? Yes. Well, then say it. Yes. Come on, guys. Yes. Oh, what? I know what I'm getting at. What about them royals? You don't know yet? All right. My next question for you all, we haven't asked this for a while. Um, raise your hand. How many of you have been real estate investors for five years or less? Okay. Who, how many of you have been real estate investors for five or ten years? And how many of you have been real estate investors for 15 years or more? Yeah, Keith, raise your hand. I know you have. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. The other question I have, how many of you currently are buying and holding as rentals? Wow. How many of you are buying and reselling? Reselling them. Okay. How many of those people are reselling them to temp to owners, occupied? Good job, guys. Okay. Just like to get a feel of what you all are doing. Um. And then the other thing, I. The other thing. We're going to start having our deal table again towards the end of the year. Um, I talked to Dave the other day, and we're going to start having that. You'll see that come out in the emails. Announcements of it and the website. Okay, we're going to have a deal table before the meeting where people will bring their deals and look for deals. November, our speaker in November is going to be the FBI. Huh? Is it? Bob? Just the last time the FBI. Yeah, but the, she's not, she's out in, I talked to her after 27 years, she decided to go out in the field. It's like, are you crazy? I wouldn't go out because you have to be in your late 40s then at least. But we're going to have Bob Herndon in, and he is the person in charge of white collar crime in Kansas City. So he's going to talk about all kinds of white, white collar crime that's in the area, including mortgage fraud. Okay, because I've seen being with investors as long as I have, so many times there's a lack of knowledge. And that lack of knowledge, what it can do. On deals, it can bite you in the backside and take you 11 months. So it's, I, once in a while, every couple of years, I like to have the FBI come in to talk, to educate you all, because then at least I put it out there, and if you're in Ludworth, I don't feel that bad for you. Huh? I I no, I wouldn't do that. That's nasty. Rent is cheap. How rent is cheap? Well, you get food, too. I don't know how to do it, but, you know. And so Bob Herndon is going to come and call, talk about white collar crime. Other announcement that I have. In the last couple days, I have booked where we're going to have a Saturday event. It's going to be Saturday, November 15th. And I'm trying to find the information. We are, um, okay, the speakers. We're going to have Chris Johnson, which he come in and talked earlier in the year about grant funding. Okay, I'm sure some of you know. So he's going to talk about grant funding. But then he's also going to have with him Dr. Albert Lowry. He is a trainer's trainer. He trained Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Allen, Ron LeGrand, Russ Whitney, and Carl Chief. That's some pretty good if you've trained those people. You've got some knowledge. And so we're going to talk about grant funding, creative financing, foreclosures, tax liens and deeds. And then at the end of the program, they've got another benefit too, but I'm going to make that be a surprise. <laughs> so all the cost of the Saturday event, we're going to have it down at the Lyric Theater, downtown, down at, I think 17th in Baltimore, I think. 
All of it's on the website. They have free parking there on both sides, so you don't have to worry about parking. The other thing, uh, I wanted people to be able to come out and learn. Tickets are $20 person or $35 for a couple for parking. All this needs to be got. We can't sell them here. You'll go to our website at kcig.org and you will go down there and you'll sign up through Eventbrite and buy your ticket. Okay? Do you all think that sounds like a, a day that would be beneficial to you? Yes. I mean, if he taught Kiyosaki, gosh, and Robert Allen, and Robert Rand, and he still teaches, that's pretty cool. So anyway, is there any questions anyone has? That event, what time does it begin? Oh, 9 o'clock. All day event. All day event. And then two, um, and we're not going to, how many of you all are veterans? We are also going to have a Friday event with these people for veterans. It's going to be not real estate related, it'll be business related. It's free to veterans, okay? So if you're a veteran, let me know. And if you want to attend it, it's only going to be a four hour seminar and we're not going to, we're going to mainly publish it out through the VA, uh, the nonprofits and everything. Okay, but it's going to be strictly business Business design, business plan. Okay? That's the 14th, and it's from 9 to 1. Lyric? <coughs> Have any of you ever been to the Lyric? Is it nice? Is it? Well, we aren't going to have it in the auditorium. Well, unless they have a whole bunch of design tickets, we might go to the auditorium. <laughs> Okay, well this evening, I, I wanted, when we started thinking about the land bank, I'm sure all of you have heard about the land bank and the Homestead Authority, right? Who here hasn't heard about those, those names? Okay, and that it's kind of like the government's a little confusing, right? <laughs> so I reached out to the, to the land bank and I was lucky enough that Ted Anderson said he would come and talk and teach us about this, about what opportunities. As investors, it's important to look at everything with open eyes and hearts. You never know the possibilities out there. Okay? Uh, to give you an idea real quick, and I'll sum this up, I've got a project I'm working on, I'm a visionary on it. And I'm creating a community of housing for veterans. And so, you know what? Look in your eyes and in your brain, and you'll find the answers. That's my kind of guy. <laughs> Would you all help me? Because if by doing that, you get more participation with groups like them, okay? When you give back to the community. So, please help me welcome Ted. Come on up, Ted. Um, we do have the flyers for the Saturday event back there, so you all just pick them up on your way out, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for having me tonight. My name is Ted Anderson. I am the Executive Director of the Land Bank of Kansas City and the President of the Homestead Authority. Um, before that, I was an attorney for the city of Kansas City uh, for 13 years. Uh, I handled dangerous buildings at times, uh, a lot of condemnation work, handled a lot of development work for the city of Kansas City, Missouri. And acquired most of the real estate for the Sprint Arena and uh, the entertainment district and all the big projects that we've done over the last probably 10 years. So, um, See if this will work. Arrow? Arrow. There we go. Uh, what is land banking? Land banking is the practice of aggregating parcels of land for future sale and development. We have a land trust uh, that the 
city of Kansas City was part of for many, many years. And um, uh, we mostly funded the land trust. We gave the land trust a million dollars a year. Uh, our partners were Jackson County, Missouri, and the school district of Kansas City, Missouri. They didn't give the land trust any money at all. Um, there weren't any profits to split it. But we found that most of our money was being spent in areas outside of Kansas City. So we wanted a better solution. We wanted to sort of control our own destiny a little better than what we were. Is that volume going up? Is the volume yeah. going up now? I'm, I need to watch it. Do you have a red light on this mic? Establishment of quasi governmental county or municipal authorities purposed with managing an inventory of surplus land. One of the theories behind the land bank is that you take the 4,000 or so vacant properties in the city um, that we know the ownership of and that, that nobody wants, and we put those under one umbrella and then we can manage those better with our mowing contracts and nuisance abatement and things like that. So that's kind of the theory, is that the city would rather take probably ownership of the vacant properties, even though it's a lot of responsibility, because they ruin property values for the, for the other properties on, in the area. Kansas City has 12,000 to 16,000 vacant lots. Um, Vacant lots aren't really the problem, though. It's vacant houses that are a problem. They're haven for crime. Our firefighters and police have to enter those places not knowing what they're walking into, and they're a real problem. Kansas City has about 2,000 vacant structures. I was in Baltimore about a month ago. Uh, and saw the problem that other people in the country were having, other cities. Baltimore's got 17,000 vacant structures. Uh, Cleveland doesn't really know how many vacant structures they have, but they think it's about 25,000. Uh, Detroit has 38,000 vacant structures. Kansas City has 12,000 to 16,000 vacant lots. Um, about 3,300 of those belong to the land bank, and I suspect the rest of them will sooner or later. Uh, the city of Kansas City and the land bank own uh, 1,000 of the 2,000 vacant structures. <coughs> of the 1,000 structures that we own, probably 225 of those are nasty enough that they would be emergency demolitions if they were owned by a private citizen. What caused this? Uh, Deindustrialization, the decline of manufacturing. Uh, there's not centralized employment in cities anymore. You can live just about wherever you want. Um, the second reason is suburbanization, suburbanization, um, otherwise known as white fly. Uh, the third is the mortgage crisis of 2008. How do we get our inventory? Um, we're sort of like the McDonald's buyer at the cattle auction. Everything that's left after the delinquent tax sale, we just take it. It's just like the McDonald's guy does. Everything that doesn't sell, he takes. So we do the same thing at the delinquent land tax sale. We were actually this year the biggest buyer at the tax sale. Uh, we own so much land in some parts of town that there are a whole lot of areas where we own four or five properties on a block, and if the last one comes up for sale, I'd rather own it than somebody else. I have a better chance of, of repurposing that land if I have an assembly of lots. That's the other theory behind the land bank, is if we can assemble enough land, um, it takes a big footprint to redevelop in the 
inner city. So um, that's one of our purposes. Uh, we did the tax sale, like I said. We take donations. Actually, someone tonight uh, had a property they wanted to donate. We're going to look into that. The only thing we can't do is uh, we can't give them property for the land. Right? We were authorized by the Missouri General Assembly in 2012. Um, it actually was quite a fight. The county wanted to keep us in the land trust. So did the school district. Um, we had some legislators who were against the land bank, and it took about two years uh, for the land bank legislation to get passed. Like I mentioned, we replaced the uh, land trust of Jackson County. We have a five-member uh, board. We are a uh, Missouri nonprofit, and you'll, you'll see why in a minute. Um, we have a five-member board. Um, three of those folks are appointed by the mayor of Kansas City. One is appointed by the school district, and one is appointed by Jackson County. That was a concession we made to pass the legislation. Uh, we gave those folks a voice. Um, between April and June of 2013, so about the first year we spent writing laws, putting procedures together, uh, running office space, hiring employees, and things like that. And then April, sort of Armageddon hit. We, we got 3,600 of the worst properties in the city dumped on us all at one time. Bad legal descriptions, you know, it was pretty terrible. So we've, we're still, we've still got a few of those properties that we need to sort out. Um, the Jackson County Land Trust is still around. They just take care of property outside of the city of Kansas City, but inside the county of Jackson County. Uh, today, the land bank owns about 4,300 properties. We have a staff of six. We have a budget of, it's actually 2.1 million, and we office at 4,900 Swope Park there north and west of Swope Park. Um, our operations, uh, we're going to mow uh, all of our lots uh, four times this year. We started in April. We're already finished. We're not going to mow anymore. Um, we spent $900,000 to mow all those lots four times. And some of those lots now are grass is about this high. Um, we use uh, to mow what we call the Adopt the Neighborhood Program. And this was a pretty nifty effort by the neighborhood associations in the city of Kansas City and the land bank. We, we contract with neighborhood associations in areas where there is a strong neighborhood association. And we, they mow the grass for us. They usually have one sort of adult or older adolescent, I guess, in some cases, and a bunch of kids. And um, they mow the lots in their own uh, neighborhood. So uh, we figure we'll get a little better job and they'll do a better job because they'll be pride in their own area. Um, their folks will see to that, we think. And um, we keep some youth employed and they cost us about $10, 8 to $10 a lot to mow that way. So we get a big bang for our buck. Um, back to why we're a nonprofit. Um, here's, here's, here's our business model. We, we take property into inventory in big lumps. Whatever's left at the tax sale, like I said, this year we're probably going to take about 500 properties all at one time. We assess all of those. Every structure we go in and take pictures, make notes. We do, we write up an assessment of what we think it would take to number one, abate the code violations on that property, and then number two, what it would take to rehab that property to a habitable standard. We do the assessment, we cut the, we, we, we take care of whatever trees there are. Um, if folks had not taken care of their houses, like these houses haven't been taken care of for quite a few years, they for sure didn't take care of their trees. So we've got dangerous trees on just about all of our properties. 
that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, we cut trees, we trim trees. That's actually not one of our houses, that's a neighbor's house, but that is our tree. Uh, that kind of thing happens with some regularity. So uh, we actually use the park department now to take all those trees and, and get rid of them. Uh, like I said, we cut the grass four times a year. Uh, if the structure is bad enough on the property and we have money, this year we've done it. Um, we demolish the house. We market the property for sale. We maintain it on our website. And then we document the sale. And we all do that. We do all that. If, if we have to do all that on the property, it costs about 10000 bucks. And then at the end, we have a lot that we can sell for maybe $200. That's why we're not a problem. But that's what we have to do to sort of keep our neighborhoods even as healthy as they are. How do we help? Um, uh, our buyers, uh, we sort of uh, check into pretty good. We don't like speculators. We like investors. Um, speculators are folks who buy property and wait to see if something's going to happen. In, in our experience, sorry, that's a bad idea. In our experience, um, that just doesn't work. We end up taking those properties back generally at some point. Um, and at least we end up taking care of the grass and the dumping and things like that. So if you're going to buy a property from the land bank, you can't have delinquent taxes or a bunch of unremediated code violations. Um, we do a background check. If you're a drug dealer or had a history of prostitution, or you're on the, or you're a registered sex offender, the land bank won't sell you property. And, and it, it's not a moral thing, it's those things tend to degrade the neighborhood and they're real estate based. Um, we notify our neighborhood associations when somebody's going to buy a piece of property from us. We tell them who it is, we tell them what they're going to do, and we ask them if they object. Sometimes they say yes. Um, we put, we ask that you submit a plan. If you buy a structure from us, we ask that you submit a plan um, of what you're going to do to rehab the structure. And we do check and make sure that your plan is reasonably comparable to the plan that our guys drew up. If our guys know that there's gutters hanging off the property and you submit your plan to us and you don't have a plan to fix the gutters, We'll look into that, and my board has actually turned folks down um, who have applied to, buy, applied to buy a property from us with the structure on it if we didn't think they were serious about their plan. We put a deed of trust on the property, not for money. The deed of trust says that you're going to do what you did, what you told us you were going to do in your plan. We give you time to do it, but if you don't follow through and fix up the house, we could come get it. We, we don't want it back. Um, and the only way we would do that is if it was a problem for the neighborhoods and they called us and said, hey, this guy you sold this property to it isn't taken care of. The people are dumping on the property. We would come get that property back. Uh, we accept property donations, like I mentioned. We maintain the properties. Uh, we do proactive marketing, and we encourage alternative uses. Um, there's a lot of folks out there who do urban farming on, on vacant lots. We encourage that. Um, we have noticed, though, that to grub a lot, you guys know what grubbing a lot is? Um, most of our lots haven't been cared for in a long time, so they start closing in from the outside. There's volunteer trees, there's bush, there's all kinds of things that just grow, they go back to nature. And um, when you grub a lot, when, if you're going to do farming, you have to get rid of all those trees and all that stuff and all that junk. So they bring a big machine around, and everything that's smaller than six inches, they just pull out of the ground like that, and that's grubbing. That costs about $3,500 on one lot. So it, it's urban farming isn't really 
necessarily the only answer to a lot of problems. That's a lot of times, that's not really feasible. Uh, the outcomes of the land bank, we get neighborhood revitalization, uh, one house at a time. We've, we've noticed that in some inner city blocks, there's only one problem property. And a lot of times we've been able to take care of those. Um, and that sure makes our neighborhoods a better place. We do community redevelopment. We cooperate with the homesteading authority, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, we do some economic development. We provide jobs for folks who take care of our property, too. Um, we have, I don't know how much this is to go into. Um, we have several different programs. Um, if we have a lot that's a vacant lot in the city, used to have a house on it. In a lot of cases, codes nowadays won't allow a house to be put back on that property because there's uh, side variances and things like that. So um, we, we have these lots that are too small to build on. And if somebody wants to add that to their backyard, side yard, front yard, whatever, we'll sell those in a lot of cases for a dollar and just get those back on the tax roll. We haven't, th there were some folks who wanted to lease our lots for a while, but we, we really haven't pursued that. <laughs> And the adopt a lot program was a way for somebody um, who lived next door to the lot that was being dumped on and wasn't being taken care of, that they could just take care of it if they wanted to without having to own it and um, take some of the liabilities that might go with that. <coughs> Pardon me. We haven't done much of that either. Um, we are conscious of the fact that we don't want to demolish our good housing stock in the middle of the city. We favor um, programs and plans that would uh, refurbish a house instead of demolish it. But we realize that there are some houses that are just too bad to save. Can you, I don't know if you can see this. We, we, we own commercial property, uh, 300 or so commercial properties. This is a lot of a property that we got from the land trust of Jackson County. So it's been sort of owned on the public dole for, for many years. And, and we, we, we found out that there was somebody operating a business in this building here, the Leroy. And you can see on the front of the building it says, I be Leroy. And Leroy on Saturday would take the boards off the front of this building he lived behind it, and he ran an extension cord down, and he operated a barber shop in this place for four or five years, you know, while it belonged to the land bank and the land trust. So we tried to sell it to him, but he didn't want it. When somebody gets something for free, you probably know it's, it's hard to sell it to him. Um, we love to sell properties. I was really glad to see Cindy ask that question. Uh, what do you guys like to do? And when she said sell properties to owner occupants to see so many hands go up. Because we love to do that too. Because nobody takes care of property like an owner. Owner occupant. Um, if you want to apply for a land bank lot, we have an application. We've got, first of all, we've got a whiz bang. Uh, website that's searchable um, uh, that you should go to. And, I, and I've got all that information in a flyer that the going to give you. Um, we take an application, we get your scope of work like I, dis like I discussed a minute ago, find out what your budget is. If you get an estimate from a license, if you're going to have a contractor do the work, we ask that you get your estimate from a, li a licensed contractor. Uh, you prove to us that you have the funds, although that's not a big deal. We, we just like to see that you're solvent and that you have enough money to complete the renovations that you're going to do. And then if you're an LLC, we like to get a copy of your operating agreement. I'm not, this is all covered in my handout, so I'm not going to go through how to apply and on the website and things like that. 
because I'm sure this is a savvy bunch. Uh, instead, I'm going to go to the uh, homesteading authority, which would probably be more interesting to you guys than the land bank. The land bank is a much bigger operation. We run it. We run the homesteading authority and the land bank out of my office with the same staff. Um, so a lot of the things we do are the same. But the homesteading authority is a. Um, it's sort of an ancient. Uh, group, uh, the way it functions now, it's a non-profit quasi-city agency. Uh, but back in the day, you used to actually homestead through the homestead authority, um, and you get land grant lands that way. Um, goes way back. Uh, nowadays, what the homestead authority does, we take land from banks who have made a decision that they're not going to foreclose on certain properties. So uh, usually it's been Bank of America, not necessarily because they're great people, but because they have a consent decree where they've told the government that they're going to do so much work in our cities with their properties. Um, so one way they've found to do it is to partner with the city of Kansas City and our homestead authority. And, and the way this has worked uh, today the, the homestead authority, first of all, has about 800 properties. Um, probably 250 of those have structures on them, um, and the rest are vacant lots. But uh, normally, the way this has worked is we'll get a call. Somebody in the city will get a call, and uh, there'll be a bank-owned property with code <coughs> violations or something like that to indicate that it's not being taken care of. So um, those calls all end up, not all of them, I'm sure, but most of them end up being funneled to uh, me and the homesteading authority. And we call those banks and we say, hey, we don't appreciate you keeping your property like that in the city of Kansas City. And, um, but we could do something about those tickets if you want to give us that property. And because most of the properties that are sort of advantageous for the banks to foreclose on, they foreclose on them. They don't just let them sit there. So there is a whole category, as investors, you guys probably already know this, but there is a whole category of houses out there that are owned by banks that the banks can't foreclose on because it's they, either they've been written off already or it's not going to be profitable for them. Doesn't mean it's a bad house. It just meant they let they lent too much money on it, and that happened quite a bit. So I'll call the bank, and I, I have a secret black book with phone numbers in it uh, for, for a lot of the banks and a lot of the servicers. And I'll call them and say, like I said, uh, why don't you give that property to us? And Bank of America said, we'll do that. And we'll give you money to fix it up, and we have a lot of properties like that. So they agreed to give us 75 properties. And they weren't identified at that time. They just agreed that they were going to give us 75 properties. And they were either going to give us $20,000 to rehab a structure, or they were going to give us $7,500 to demolish the structure. So from Bank of America at one time, not at one time, but um, as a result of that transaction, they gave us 75 houses. And those were 75 blocks that we could sort of make healthy again. The, the goal of the Homestead Authority is to put properties back into production and put folks in houses that weren't able to be in houses the normal way. So um, a lot of those houses, well, those houses range from ones that have been picked through by people who, I love these people, who go in there and steal $40 worth of copper and do $5,700 worth of damage doing that, you know. Uh, some of those houses have been like that. For a while, we were putting for sale signs in front of some of those houses, and then we realized pretty quick that that was just like putting a neon arrow saying, Come steal everything out of this house. Nobody lives here. So <laughs> we, 
we don't put them, we don't put for sale signs on there. We put them on our website. And we've noticed most of the copper thieves probably don't have web access, I guess, because they've stayed for you since then. Um, some of those houses have been picked through. Some of those houses are on streets just like yours and mine. Um, and all you have to do is walk in there and paint. Um, we've had houses that we've had 15 offers on in the first couple of weeks. So there are a lot of folks that watch on the website for that. Of the 75 houses that Bank of America gave us, there's only two left. But for the last year and a half or so, we've been trying to do the same thing with other banks. Sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. So we, get, we have an inventory of 200 houses right now. Um, uh, we get houses a couple times a month probably. Um, a lot of our vacant lots are being assembled for redevelopment. Um, I don't know if any of you all have seen what Ollie Gates is doing, 47th and Tracy. Uh, a lot of that property was land bank property, homesteading property. Uh, unlike the city of Kansas City, the homesteading authority and the land bank uh, can assemble property for folks. If I know you're doing a development in a certain area, and, and I know you're, uh, you're a guy who generally pulls permits and generally does a good job and does what he says he's going to do, if I know you're fixing up houses in Squire Park, um, I could go buy property in Squire Park at the tax sale and not even put any money down. And I could flip it to you. I can assemble that and flip it to you. And if somebody else from the city, if, if, if you came to me and said, I like that property in Squire Park. Uh, here's ten thousand dollars. I'd like to buy it. I could say no. I'm saving that for somebody else. So um, that's one of the things both the Homestead Authority and the Land Bank uh, does. And most of the property in the Homestead Authority is just like that. We're saving. We're assembling it for somebody else. Uh, a lot of times, if you're going to do a big redevelopment in the city. Uh, the city will give you the land, and, um, which is a lot of times when, when I did this type of thing, when I acquired land for the city and for redevelopment, uh, a lot of times that assembly of land was the hardest part, and there was always a couple of people who held out and couldn't buy it. So it's kind of nice if we could just say, say the Habitat for Humanity or somebody like that. Here I own five lots right in the road. I own this whole lot. Go build five houses, you know. Um, and that works out really nice. And it, it meets our goals. We're not necessarily in this to make money. Both of those uh, associations are nonprofits. Uh, not to say that we wouldn't like to make some money, but that helps us demolish more houses and mow some more grass. But the homestead authority, I think, if you're just a flipper or you're a rehabber and you just do one house at a time, that's not a bad place to look. I don't know how much time I got left. Um, happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Are you a book from KC Mo and KC? No. Um, the land bank is only authorized by statute to do business within the city of Kansas City, Missouri. That's not necessarily just Jackson County, it's North of the River, the whole city. Um, the Homestead Authority can operate within the city of Kansas City, and we're not quite sure if we can operate outside of Kansas City, but we wouldn't operate in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. That's just not our mandate. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're trying to fix up the city, Kansas City. So if we find a good buyer or a guy who wants to do a deal, we'll try to move them over to Kansas City. But Kansas City, Kansas has a land bank too. Yes. You're familiar with it. Chris Slaughter, I had lunch with him last week. Matter of fact, this week, Monday afternoon. Um, he came over to our offices. He's got uh, 2,300 properties in his land bank, and he's got staff of one. <laughs> so it's kind of cool the way they do business. They have a, a computer station set up 
right there by his desk. And if you want to buy a property from them, he puts you on a computer until you find something you like, you know, and you can buy it right there. He just he slaps it on a quick thing and sends it out to you. One thing we do, let me let me state this because this is really important. Um, there's a lot of title issues with tax sale. These properties have a lot of hair on them. I mean, they're nasty and they're nobody wanted them, and there's reasons for that usually. And they have sometimes a lot of title issues. And sometimes when the county foreclosed on them, they didn't do it right. So a lot of times they have issues. We don't just stick these legal descriptions on a quick claim deed and send them out. We fix up the titles. So, um, well, sometimes we can't fix them all the way up. But, but, but we'll, if, if we notice the county didn't notify somebody right, first of all, we'll check with the county and get their notices. We'll look through them and make sure they did it right. If there's a bank or something, they didn't foreclose. They didn't notice up correctly. Um, we'll try to get a, a, a release of that mortgage. And it's, it's not as hard as it seems. Um, you haven't been paid on this thing in 10 years. You wrote it off a long time ago. We want to put it back into production. Um, will you let us do that? And usually they will. So we'll fix those up. we put it on a special warranty deed so you get bank financing if you want to. Um, you get title insurance if you want to. But sometimes they, make, they do the same thing we do. They look up the notices and things like that to make sure that um, people will know stuff right. But uh, uh, one thing land banks haven't done is just that. They haven't let you get title insurance on your property. And that's, that's specifically what we're trying to do. We want you to invest money, and we want you to be able to do that without losing your money. And so we give people special one TV. And I know you had a question. You had a question. So go ahead. Um, the houses that Bank of America gave to you, what was your average selling price? What did you sell them for? Well, here's, here's the way we do things in Homestead Authority. Here's the other reason we're a nonprofit. Um, one of many reasons we're a nonprofit. We'll, we'll consider what you're going to put into it as part of your purchase price. So, so we may sell that house for five thousand bucks. If you're going to put forty thousand into it, that's one of the reasons we hold you to that because we consider that part of your. We consider that a forty-five thousand dollars sale against his thirty thousand dollars cash loan. But like I say, we're going to hold you to what you said you're going to do. We, you don't necessarily have to spend forty thousand dollars, but you got to fix the place up, put it back into production. So, and uh, you had a question. Yeah, I could hear this question. There was something about another land bank, Chris Lawler. Was that the name? Chris Chris Slaughter uh, is the executive director of the land bank in Kent. Don't write that. You don't even call him that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy, and. Um, and we're collegial and we cooperate with each other, things like that. So, do you know about the neighborhood alliance? How is that the same or different? Well, the, the neighborhood alliance, um, I, I think, um, well, there, there's three or four organizations just like that, with, with, with names just like that. Um, there's the Kansas City Vacant Lot Alliance, um, which, I, which I'm on. Um, the Neighborhood Alliance, is that the group that meets at Rockers College? I don't know where they meet. I, I just, I'm looking at a house that they're trying to get declared abandoned. I, I, I think that's the folks uh, that Legal Aid has put together. And and they work the Missouri Abandoned Housing Act. So if there's a property that's abandoned, they can, they can name you as a receiver, you can fix it up, and then at the end of that, you can either sell it or take ownership after a court procedure. <coughs> Legal Aid will work that court procedure for you. Um, I, I think that's what that is, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, go ahead. If you had a house that I wanted to buy, how long would it take for me to acquire? Um, the land bank um, had a serious problem at the beginning. Because of those title issues, um, the land bank was taking six or seven or eight months to 
foreclose on property. But the homestead, a lot, the homestead authority hasn't had that problem. The reason they brought me in to the land bank is because I can say that I am a Kansas City urban real estate redevelopment transaction specialist. So that's why they brought me in to slam all those things closed. And we are really close. We're, we're maybe two months behind. And we're at the point where if it's a structure, we almost have those caught up. If it's a vacant lot, so what? Uh, it's, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter if those things don't close uh, as much. If it's not a redevelopment piece, it's just adding that to somebody's yard or doing those lands. But we're almost caught up in the land bank, and the homestead authority hasn't really had that problem. So uh, maybe we, the, the land bank needs twice a month. So you need to get your application in front of that board, which I guess could take a month, depending on notices and those kind of things. Um, the homestead authority only meets once a month. So I guess they, uh, whatever the math is. So if they agree, how long would it take to? If, if they agree to sell it, um, but within a month, unless, unless there's an issue with the title, you know, and, and there still are a few like that. But, but if, it's, if it's got clean title, we can, we can ship it out within a month. No. Um, no, and I, I hope people realize that. I, I was actually in disguise buying property at the tax sale because um, I didn't want people to think that we had projects, you know, in areas that start bidding against me just because it was a good investment, you know. So I was like wearing saggy pants and wall cap and stuff. And, and, and so it was funny. So, um, I was sitting there, and people were bidding on lots, just like the lots that we own and sell for a couple hundred bucks, you know. Um, they were bidding seriously, sometimes, you know, thousands of dollars for these lots. And there's, there's no difference between the ones that we have and the ones that they were selling. The only difference was sort of this, the show going on and the competitive nature of some of those folks. So, um, you know, uh, and, and, and here's the thing, if you buy it from us, we're at least going to tell you what the title looks like, because we want you to be successful. If you buy it from tax sale, you're buying a pig and folk. Because it's those same folks that didn't notice up that bank on my property, that didn't notice up somebody on that property, too. Okay. So that's what I want to know. I mean, do your research. And that you, you, can, you can totally, here's the way to approach the tax sale, like any sort of sale, a bargain sale like that. You go in there knowing exactly what you want to buy before you get there. Um, you do your due diligence, you know, maybe get a short time report or something, and you can be successful at the tax sale. If there's something there that's strategic to you, you can't just go there and start bidding against people and stuff like that and go with the flow because you'll get killed. The properties that you all acquire then are they cleared about any liens and encumbrances from the past? Let me let me let me mention let me talk about that just a minute, so because that's important. Um, the, the the statute that enables the tax sale is the Land Tax Collection Act, and the purpose of the Land Tax Collection Act is to put troubled properties back into production. Um, that enables the land bank and um, the land trust, all those agencies. It's all on that same law. Um, the problem is that the Constitution of the United States says that if I own property, I'm due notice before you take it away from me. So the, the statute, the Missouri statute, um, says that you can send notice certified to the bank, you can publish in the paper, uh, which the county leans on pretty heavily. And, and so they figure they've given everybody notice, but the courts have said, under the Constitution of the United States, you can't just publish in a local paper in Missouri against a bank that's registered in Virginia 
and sell their property. So you have that issue. Uh, the law is meant to foreclose those liens, but only if the procedures are done right and those folks have a chance to defend themselves. Missouri's a, Missouri's a heavily, uh, Missouri believes heavily in property rights being a historical farming state. So um, uh, the courts hold the county and us to those notice provisions, and if they're not notified, their interest is still alive. Even though, in most cases, like I mentioned, they haven't been paid in years and years and years. They wrote that thing off a long time ago. Okay. Yes. So, if you're in the city and you have these properties, your taxes, you don't have to keep the taxes up on these. Um, taxes. <laughs> taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the ta at the ta even at the tax sale, if you buy a property at the tax sale, or if nobody buys it and it comes to us, the taxes are wiped out. Until we buy it. Because, because the, 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 the tax sale, the minimum bid at the tax sale, is what's owed on the property. So you're in effect paying those taxes up to date if you buy it. If you don't, they just disappear. If it comes to us, they just they just disappear. So while you hold it, no matter how long you hold it, it's still not being taxed. Right. So Correct. it's not accumulating. It. Guess what I'm saying? Correct. Okay. And then when you buy it from us, they start to buy it. Like that. But there's no past taxes right. added to the sale. Right. Okay. Those are Jackson County taxes, and Jackson County definitely got notice of their own tax sale, so you don't have to worry about real estate taxes. Kansas City got notice of the tax sale, so you don't have to worry about demo liens. Demo liens, folks, if you're buying lots in Kansas City, Missouri, there used to be a house on that lot, and it cost $8,500 to take down. So you got to make sure that there's no tax, no, no, no demo lien on that property. I used to collect on those. It's a mighty disillusionment for somebody who bought a $200 lot to find out they now owe. Uh, City of Kansas City, eight five hundred bucks plus five years worth of interest in eleven you know, percent. I hate to leave you on that kind of note with that bad taste. In your mouth. Let's say something pleasant. Maybe. <laughs> um, anything else? Go ahead. I'm not sure. My staff made those up. I'm not sure what you have. We sell property every day, and I'm not sure that we update it daily. Um, I, it's updated for sure when we when we get properties from the tax sale, and as we get properties into the homesteading authority, as we close on them, they're added to the website. I'm not saying there's not some lag time, but they're pretty current. And if you called us, if you called us and said you have anything else, I could maybe say, you know, we haven't got anything for a while, so I'm sure it's good. Or if we've gotten something in, I can tell you about it. Go ahead. You ever get condos? Um. Yes. But we haven't got like a healthy, good condo in a long time. What, what we get are the common areas of condos that, that folks, nobody's been in charge of paying taxes on them. And like, like a retaining wall that's falling down and stuff like that, or, or some kind of uh, sewage treatment thing behind the condo in, in certain rural areas that nobody wants to take care of so they don't pay taxes on it. We get stuff like that. We, we hardly ever get like a healthy condo um, because those are condos are mostly, that's, that's sort of a new invention, 15, 25, maybe years old, and they don't really do that in, in, in areas where they're not likely to be vibrant. So if, if, if you don't pay your taxes on your condo, Chances are somebody's going to buy that at the tax sale if it's a decent place. 
we, if you look at our website, you'll see a map, I think, the map is on there. And it's got a green dot every place we own a piece of property. And for instance, the land bank, um, you'll notice it's almost a solid green dot around um, 70 Highway, around 71 Highway, from Prospect over to um, the Eastern City. Uh, we have a lot of stuff in areas where the property's not very valuable. The homesteading authority can own property and does own property all over the city. It's just some, if, if you see the properties we own in Red Bridge and stuff like that, they're not a traditional house. They're a lot that's left over at the end of the subdivision or something like that. So it, don't get too excited when you see the green dots, you know, in the West Plaza area because they're not really houses and things like that with three bedrooms and two baths and two car garages. Do you ever have commercial? Yeah. We've got we've got 300 commercial properties in the um, land bank, and I forget, Sydney, maybe eight of those have structures on them, like the Roy's place, most of them, you know. But uh, what is the we, we we have stuff we have stuff in floodplains, you know, that you may not be interested in, but but. Uh, there's some issue. A lot of times it was just maybe a state tax lien. Um, they kept the property from being uh, valuable. And uh, Missouri tax liens get killed through the tax sale process. So we have those properties unencumbered. They sell pretty fast so once we get them. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I like something. Bob Herndon next week, next month, because he and I put a guy in jail one time. <laughs> he and I put a guy in jail one time. Yeah, he's gonna talk. He's gonna talk about the movie uh, that Rob Lowe was in. That he was involved in that one. Um, not, not the Las Vegas casino. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget.